Now it's my pleasure to introduce my dad, Rene, Rene Julien de Fourneau. He comes from a very small medieval town in France, and you know he he left there and he came to the United States. The United States is a, his adopted country. He was naturalized here, and he is very loyal and very proud of his country. My dad is adaptable and clever. <laughs> yeah, the turban. He, uh, he's, he was once a smuggler. He smuggled suits and cigarettes over the Swiss border. So it's very interesting. And it turns out Reynald was a smuggler as well. He smuggled butter. <laughs> so, my dad is a Kiwanian. And he has 35 years of perfect attendance, and he's been a Kiwanian for 36 years. He also was awarded for being the bell ringer, the, the most dedicated bell ringer for Christmas time in, his, in Indianapolis. So when he gets into something, he does it right. He's always positive, despite the bad times. In his early 70s, he had cancer, but you know, he's still with us and he's a survivor. I mean, he's a fighter. He put a sign in our house when I was little that said, if you think you can, you will. If you think you cannot, you won't. And, you know, that's sort of been my motto my whole life. And that's been his as well. He also told me things like, you can always get a job, but you have to keep it. <laughs> Only you can do that. So I've learned a lot from my dad, and I'm very pleased to introduce him today. I have no idea what he's going to say, but I hope it's good. Thank you very much, Noel. Thank you very much for inviting me. You know, this is the first time that I saw all my book before I opened my mouth. <laughs> Now, for those who are not old, the younger people, I can assure you that growing old is wonderful. You can get away with almost anything. <laughs> uh, right? right? So I was so glad to raise that out there. You know, I haven't seen 55 years, oh you know. God. Unbelievable. Oh, my picture is gone, okay. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna tell you my first impression coming to the United States. We left 70 years ago in, in, uh, in May. We left France aboard the SS Manhattan. And our, it was late in the evening when I got aboard, so we had to go to Southampton to pick up a few more passengers. And when we reached Southampton early in the morning, they took us for breakfast. The breakfast that I was used to was different. All they had is a bunch of little flakes on the table and some milk and some sugar. And I asked, what is this? Oh, this is cornflakes. What's cornflakes? In French, you call it maïs. Maïs is chicken feed. <laughs> you mean you have chicken feed in the morning? Is it? Well, you try. So I tried, tried a bowl, another bowl. When I reached my third one, they said, I'm sorry, we don't have any more. That's it. So I, my first impression, the food was not too bad in America. You know? <laughs> Those little flakes were good. We landed in New York. My father was waiting for us. He took us to a friend of his who had a, a beautiful little cottage in, in, in Florham Park, which is near Madison. Madison historically is well known in the United States. We got to the farm. Uh, to his house, and uh, the house was not large enough to accommodate everybody, so they asked for volunteers to sleep on the screen porch at night. So it was a beautiful night, it was Saturday May. I volunteered immediately, and I settled in the, in the, on the cot in a screen, and then 
went to sleep almost immediately, but during the night, I had a nightmare. I had left France with the German ready to pounce on the French. The French was ready to, for a fight. And most of us thought that was almost impossible to avoid a war. So in my dream, I realized, I thought that my hometown had been invaded by the German and that they were fighting and I could hear noises. I couldn't hear barking. I could hear all kinds of noise. And I even had the smell of the gas they were using against the population. Well, I woke up in the morning and I was in a different country and I went for breakfast and I told my host, you know, I had a heck of a dream last night. I dreamt that, that I was back home and then the German had that with gas. He said, oh, and he laughed. He said, oh, you know, our dog chased a skunk in the backyard and he sprayed a dog. That's why it's your smell, skunk. Skunk, what is it, skunk? So I think in contact with the, the fauna and the, the, the flora of the United States very quickly. <laughs> the second day I was there, they said, okay. So um, I realized when I was in a different country, my friend who had house took me to work. He was the foreman of a nice little company. And uh, I started working for him for approximately a year. Then he wouldn't give me a raise, so I quit. And I started working for two, two Hungarian people in the same thing, and I had a good job. I, I never had any problem getting a job in the United States. So that was, that was it. Pretty soon, uh, the war did not start yet with the United States, but it was full-fledged in Europe. Now, how many of you know who started the war, World War II, in 1939? I'm from Germany, Berlin. What was that? I'm from Berlin, Germany. Okay, <coughs> who declared war to whom? Uh, uh, You'd be surprised how many people said Germany declared war. No, it didn't. The French and the British declared war even though after Mr. Chamberlain had declared that peace was in our time. But because France had invaded Poland, I mean Germany had invaded Poland, and France had an agreement with the, the Polish government that it would come to the rescue if they were attacked by anybody. This is how the war started. But very few people really know how it did happen. It's amazing. So anyway, so the French, the, the war was, was starting, and the United States were slowly rearming. A lot of people there were draft, a lot of people that I was with, my friends, my age, 18, 19, 20, they were going to the military. Pretty soon I'm left alone with a bunch of old guys and women. That was, but I kept working, and I was doing fine, working so hard, in fact, that the day the book, my boss says, you know, you better go home and take a few days off. Well, I took a few days off. I liked those day off so well that I decided I wanted some more. And he said, I cannot car carry you anymore. So I decided then that I was going to join the army because France had been invaded by the German. Everything was over. So I decided maybe I should help America. So I joined the army. They didn't have any recruiting office in those days. You went to the draft board, and when I volunteered in the draft board, they were very surprised when they found out that I was not a citizen. I didn't have to join. Uh, they say they were so happy to have me, they asked me to choose what branch of the military would you like. I said, I want the infantry. The infantry? They thought I was nuts. <laughs> Nobody volunteers for the infantry, and this is why they re you go when you don't volunteer, you go to the infantry. But I, I was a, a baby boomer of World War I. All I heard when I grew up was how the infantry had won the war. Not the Air Force, not the Navy, not the, uh, it was only because of the infantry. So I thought really, I got my choice. I got my choice. Before you know it, I'm standing about 200 young men from New York and New Jersey in Fort, in, uh, Camp Dix, on the platform was his corporal, another corporal. 
and talk to us like we were dirt. And then, <laughs> and, and he asked the question, how many of you can type? A few hands went up. You say, okay, you guys follow the corporal. He'll tell you what to do. The next thing is, how many of you speak French? I was the only one. <laughs> so, okay, you follow this corporal. Say, oh my God, they already need my expertise <laughs> in French. You see, I was so happy. So I followed the guy and we got in front of a huge building and there was a sign, Mess Hall. I had no idea what Mess Hall was. I said, Mess mm, uh, Hall, that must be something very important. So we got into a small door, we got into another door, finally we end up to the third door, and then the guy who was preceding me opened the door, flipped up the switch, and we are standing in front of three tons of potatoes. <laughs> he handed me a knife and said, start peeling, when you finish, when you finish those two buckets, you take it to the kitchen to down the hall. You have to learn French. <laughs> so I was wondering, those guys who could type, what the heck were they doing? <laughs> so, but it was not so bad, you know. I learned that if you want to be a happy time in the army, stay close to the cooks. <laughs> and they liked me so much, peeling potatoes that I peel potatoes every day. <laughs> my, I wrote a letter to my mother and said, Mom, they gave me a miserable knife to peel potatoes. So she sent me four beautiful potato peelers. <laughs> then I became the expert potato peeler in the country. I could peel a potato twice as fast as anybody else. And I gave some of my, <laughs> some of my peeler to my friends and that was it. Eventually, I got, uh, was transferred to uh, infantry training school in Texas. And, and uh, there, fortunately for me, um, our platoon sergeant was a full-blooded Cherokee Indian. And I don't know if you know this, but the Indian just you like the French people because they got all fine. Instead, the French, instead of killing Indians, married them. <laughs> uh, that, was, that was a good way of thing, doing things right. So, so he took and he, he, he taught me a lot of stuff. I learned so much from him. That was really wonderful that I used later. He, his name was uh, uh, Smiling Jim Atwell. Atwell. Atwell, Smiling Jim, and he never smiled. He looked like one of those Indians in front of the tobacco store. <laughs> And then until, uh, and I asked the question, how come the guy doesn't smile? Said, wait, wait, you'll see why. When the training was over, we went to Mineral Wells, the closest town to, the, to uh, the post. And then coming back, I saw <laughs> Sergeant Adwell with a green and a red face. He was drunk at the skunk, but he was <laughs> smiling. <laughs> This is the first time I saw the guy smiling. <laughs> anyway, so they decided that, that we would all be going to a unit uh, and led in Africa. That was the beginning of the war. We, the first, we were going to go to Africa, and I was going to join the unit, but they discovered <laughs> accidentally or on purpose that I was a toolmaker. What the heck are you doing in the country as a toolmaker? So you go to ordnance. So I was transferred to ordnance immediately, and then I became an instructor of 90 Day Wonders of Second Lieutenant, and I hated the job. I didn't want to do this. This is not what I, I didn't fight the war. I was just teaching. So I managed to get a job in a motor vehicle assembly company in Atlanta, Georgia, and I was ready to go to Africa again with a unit, an ordnance unit, when they discovered I could speak French after all these years. <laughs> what the guy speaks French? What are you doing in Ireland? You should be in military intelligence. <laughs> so to military intelligence training center, I train as an interrogator, not an interrogator of prisoner of war, an interrogator of civilians. When you interrogate civilians, it's a different 
the military enemy, all he has to do is give you his name, rank, and serial number. The civilian, they don't know what they know. You have to extract them. You have to, to, to uh, you know, calm, not calm them, you know, convince them. That, uh, you ask them, okay, what did you see? What color? What? The, and then eventually you get the truth, so they get something out of it, which was a little more difficult, more tricky than military interrogation. We're ready to go. Eventually, I'm aboard a, a, a vessel, a victory ship. 29 days aboard. We landed in Northern Ireland. And this is where the unit I was with were housed in a, in a, in a castle of Lower London Dairy. And we were put in the, in the place where they kept horses, in the stables. The horses that we I would go on, they probably hate him, I don't know. <laughs> but there were no horses. And uh, we, we stayed there for a while. And I was called in the orderly room one day, and it says, uh, the Forno, uh, you speak French, right? You're from France, I said, yes. Uh, what, uh, how would you like to go back before anybody else? And why do you propose to send me there? Well, we'll either drop you or we'll row you across the channel. I said, and he, he goes, five, yeah, are you okay? You, you, want, you don't mind? I said, okay, I'm game, I'll go. What, what, uh, what I did not tell him, I did not, he may not have known, is that when I was in the uh, training center in, in the intelligence school, they uh, asked us, a bunch of uh, non-citizens, that since you're going to be fighting for the United States, you might as well fight as citizens. So they drove us, about five or six of us, to Frederick, Maryland, to a circuit court. And then we were uh, sworn in by, uh, by a judge in, uh, with 50 other people, raise your right hand and blah, blah, blah. I didn't even know what they were talking about. And finally, the judge said, congratulations, now you are American citizen. <laughs> wow, that was easy. So we went back. We went back to our base. And then the first thing we did, we went to the first sergeant, who some of you may know him. His name was Man Mountain Dean, famous wrestler. He was our first sergeant. So we told Man Mountain, he says, you can't treat us like citizen, everybody, second-rate citizen. Now, we are real citizens. He says, oh, you guys, you haven't read the, the fine print. He says, what do you mean, fine print? He said, read what it says in your city. It says that you are an American citizen conditionally. You have to serve the entire war before you get it. Wow, I didn't even mention this to us. So, that, that was the condition they would make a citizen here to serve honorably during the entire war. We say, we don't care, that's fine. So we are now citizens. So when I, the guy who went, interviewed me in London, when we reached London, as uh, took 29 of us together. They had picked up from some, some of them were some of my friends, some were not my friends. And they said, Guys, we, um, we have a job for you. You're going to be transferred to the British Army. Well, that was it. We was a short time in the American Army. We're going to be in the British Army. <laughs> so the, uh, the British commanding officer took us over. And he said, gentlemen, first we're going to give you an assessment program. To, uh, we're going to uh, take you to a program to determine which of you really can qualify for the job we're gonna get. So it took 29 of us and for four days, they ran us to all kinds of problems, individually, as a group. I'm not gonna go to all the details, it's too many. Then finally, after four days, they ran us up, they say, you, 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 and stay here. You, you, get back to the US forces. So nine of us were selected for the British to attend commando school in Northern uh, Scotland. In Scotland, we were trained by commando, British commanders, and believe me, the training we had had, which was apparently tough in the US, was nothing. These guys were tough. We never walked. We ran all the time. From 4.30 in the morning 
to 11 o'clock at night. We walked, we ran, we did all kinds of stuff until we were really a bunch of killer. We learned how to kill people. We learned how to destroy things. We learned how to do, to communicate with radio. We did everything and possibly we, we never stopped learning things. And then, then they say eventually, now gentlemen, since you, most of you are gonna be dropped behind the line, uh, maybe it's a good idea that you learn how to jump. <laughs> so, so, um, so they, I didn't know anything about airborne operation or anything, so they took us to Ringway next to Manchester, England, and there we, we were trained. Well, I have to tell you something. Jumping up an airplane, you don't need any training because they push you. <laughs> Landing is the trick. <laughs> you better learn how to land, otherwise things break, you know, very quickly. So we became paratrooper. We went to a training. Plus, uh, for several weeks, we learned how to do certain things. Uh, in England, thinking, or tell, they tell us that England was the enemy and so on. So once this was over, one day they called me, they said, we have a mission for you. Your mission is to join an, an agent who is, is already on, on the ground and he have a reception party for you. And all you have to do is go join him and you help him, help him organize the French resistance in the southern area. So one evening, they drove me from London to a place Northern England. They didn't tell me where it was. I had no idea. They told us very little. They told me very little. The only thing I knew is that I was going to join a guy named Leon and that he had a little scar under the lower lip. This is how I will identify. And they give me a, 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 a code name, a, 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 a name that I was identified and something that he he would recognize. I was escorted by a major, and after getting dressed and everything, and checked my two suitcases to make sure I was not carrying stuff that could be lead, lead an interrogator or somebody to back to England, they say, okay, he walked with me to the tail end of a B-24. Pitch dark, it was about 11 o'clock, and as we reached the bottom, he says, you know, the phone home, I have escorted a lot of you guys. I never see anybody coming back. <laughs> Ooh, this is encouraging. <laughs> this is a wonderful trip. So I said, well, it's okay. And out of his pocket, he pulled out a nice little flask. He said, this is best God whiskey, whiskey I could get. He said, this is to give you courage. Because as a Frenchman, I didn't like whiskey. I didn't even like wine, which is strange. By milk, my drink was milk. I love milk. I could drink milk all the time. Wine, I used to hate. I used to put water. I used to put sugar. And and uh, and my uncle, who was a very religious man, said, "What are you doing with the Lord's blood? Putting all that stuff in? You're supposed to drink it pure." I never liked pure wine. Anyway, so here I am. I'm, uh, <laughs> I have a, I'm all ready, you know, and I got aboard the B-24. The B-24 had only two weapons in the tail end. Nothing else, everything else was removed. Two big doors or a window covered with plexiglass. And the, the plane was loaded with 10 containers. No, 12 containers, about that high, about that big around. Instead of bombs, there were containers loaded with supply that I was going to be using when I reached my destination. We, um, when we, uh, when I got aboard, they pulled me through. Uh, the man who was with me behind the bomb bay was a young man who was supposed to be helping me with my parachute, make sure everything was okay, and push all the material I had with me, thick, big boxes, through the hole. I jumped out of the hole. They removed the bottom turret of the airplane and there was a four four feet uh, diameter hole that 
covered with a piece of plywood, and I was supposed to exit the plane from that place there. Okay, so here I am, I'm ready. We take off, and uh, I was listening to the conversation. Oh, by the way, my two suitcases with a parachute on top of it, I sat on it as my seat, that was the only thing, and hang on the, 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 uh, the side of the plane. And we start moving toward the runway, and I heard, you know, Joe, Joe, so I said, there must be a guy named Joseph aboard. And the dispatcher nudged me, he said, no, that's you. I said, what do they want? They want the little flask. You know what they give you? Oh, I said, sure, here it is. So through the B-24, there is a slide. It says, how you go to the cockpit from the back. You slap on the, you get on the slide and you slide on your stomach. And this is where my courage went. I put my courage on the slide, give it a shove, and close the door. That's the last time I saw my courage. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so we climbed to about 7,000 feet, we crossed the channel, and the pilots say, look below, they're bombing, they, they're shelling the, sh the shore, and you could see the explosion, we could see things, sometimes you could see a little smoke, and then all of a sudden we got hit by the German anti-aircraft, they started pounding all over us. Now they could not see us, but they could hear us. They knew pretty much where we were and that's what's going on for a while until things got quiet. All the plane was going up and down, so we, like, finally we escaped the attention of the German air aircraft and we, we went directly to our base, low was put to jump. Pretty soon the, the, um, the not the pilot, but the navigator says, we are close to our destination. Get ready. So the dispatcher removes the piece of wood that was over the hole. He makes sure my parachute was on all right. The parachute was attached to a strong point in the plane. And as I was leaving, the static line would extend. And normally we used to jump from 600 to 650 feet of altitude, which give us some time to get ready to hit the ground. So here I am, I have my feet on the hole, I waited, I get the signal, I get a flap, a, a, a nudge on the back, I went out. It seems I just left the plane, I just heard the the, uh, the plane open, uh, the, the, it makes a, uh, uh, when the when chute opens, it makes a funny noise, poof. I said, okay, I'm all right. I came down, but instead of waiting a while to get in, I'm on the ground already. My God, they dropped me low. I said, gee, those guys were way lower than 650 feet. Because normally it would give me something to get ready to hit. I was completely relaxed, which was probably a good thing. This is why uh, when you jump out of an airplane, you better be drunk, so you be fully relaxed. <laughs> this is the only way you will be. If you're not, you have a tendency of getting tense. When you, when you see the earth coming at you. This is why I used to jump at, I used to like jumping at night because you don't see the ground coming at you. Anyway, so I'm gonna go on. I was expecting somebody to rush to me with a glass of wine and a piece of cheese and say, welcome to France, you know. Not at all. Well, I hear the plane drifting away. I hear you talk in the distance, barking. Nobody. I said, my God, they didn't capture. My God, I'm in the middle of the, they're probably surrounded by Germans. So I, I was starting to fold my parachute. I was going to hide. Oh, and by the way, <laughs> They dropped me in a very nice place, you know, it's full of post, sharp as needle, all over me, and I felt between two. Oh, wow, what a look. If I had fallen up, instead of me, they would have found a, a shish kebab in the morning. <laughs> Holy mackerel, this guy. Why, why? And I heard voices coming from me. All I had with me is a little 32. 32. I said, gee, those guys got closer. And I listened and talked, but I didn't understand the language. It certainly was not German. It certainly was not French. And by God, it was not English. What kind of language did Lucy was speaking? And they got closer. 
my God, they were Orientals. He said, that's it, they dropped me in the wrong continent. I <laughs> <laughs> missed France entirely. I'm like, oh. with sign language, take me to the leader, the, you know. Uh, one guy walked first, I follow him, you know, I came here. Oh, and they had a big rifle, they had a big rifle. Me and my little 32, those two guys with two rifles. Finally, we got in front of it by a tree, stood a French officer. And I couldn't understand, it was illegal for the French to wear uniform. If the, if the German caught you in uniform, that you, you were dead meat, that was it. The guy standing there, you know, with the uniform of, of uh, colonial troops, French troops. And I said, do you do this every night? You know, you stand with <laughs> He said, yeah, I said, yeah. Said, Sometimes stuff dropped to us. This is not exactly what we were told, you know. He said, what? I said, you have a radio? No, do you have a radio? You know, you, you know who I was? No, you're not expecting. Where are you going? He said, and I told him, the general area, he said, oh, you're about 50 kilometers from where? You, they dropped me in the wrong place. He said, that's not. I said, but uh, what, what, what are you going to do? What are you going to do with all the, the stuff that dropped with me? Because uh, the place was run, uh, loaded with parachute, with the containers, my packets, and everything. Oh, don't worry, we'll take care of it. We'll take care of it. Wow. Do you do that every night? You stay out and what? I said, yeah. That was, I never heard of this before. And they suddenly never mentioned this. I was supposed to have a reception party, and this is what I got, a guy who happened to be there by luck, you know. So he took me to a farmhouse. I spent the first, it was, by then it was about one o'clock in the morning. We got into the house from an outside stair. He opened a door. I don't know if he owned a farm or not. He opened a door, and there was a cot there, and a blanket. I was, carrying a money belt with about half a million francs in it and I was supposed to pay for the, the people we were using and my little 32 so I found some it was a dirty place I put stuff where I could find a hole to put my, the stuff that I was carrying and was lying down and I said to myself what am I going to do I don't know anybody I don't even know where I am and all of a sudden, I heard the noise. And the noise that I've heard in Aberdeen many times, tanks, tanks are coming. And sure enough, one tiger tank under my window, two tiger tanks, I said, my God, if they stop, come to the farm and ask me a question, I don't know, what am I going to tell them? So immediately I stopped thinking, well, I got to tell him something, got to tell him I don't even know who lives here. So I didn't know anything. Fortunately, the, the entire unit moved away, and I was able to relax a little bit. I went downstairs in the morning. Those guys, a man and a woman, they knew apparently I was there. Somebody told them. And I said, have you seen my two suitcases? No. I said, they were with me. He said, what happened to the stuff? No, I was the one who helped taking all the stuff away. I never did. So I said, can, can we go back to them? And she went up and found my two suitcases in the ditch. They were covered with grass. And you could have seen them. This is why they didn't see them. So we got my two suitcases. On, and they decided that, that, OK, that's just time for you to get out of here. Uh, we don't know if the Germans are aware of the drop or not, so we're going to take you to a hideout in the woods. They took me to the hideout in the woods, and the first thing I noticed in the clearing, two women, two women, their hands tied behind their back, their feet, their feet tied together. They were leaning against the trunk of a tree, and when I look at them, they had, the, they had burn in their legs. Inside the legs were black. One of them had maggots on it. I said, what is this? I said, oh, they're collaborators. Collaborators? What do you mean collaborators? Well, they, uh, we, uh, we, think, we think they give uh, information to the Germans. 
fun information. You know, how did you do? Well, they, um, you know, they were friendly with the German. Did you have a, a, a trial? No, no, we don't need any trial. We know who is guilty and who is not guilty. That was my first contact with the French resistance. I said to myself, oh, we have a bunch of real characters in France. They take the justice in their own hands. They do what they please. This is not exactly what we were expecting to see, what I was expecting to see. I didn't dare say anything because I didn't want to hand up items to women. You know. So I didn't say. Eventually, I kept asking people if they knew a guy named Leon. No. If they had seen a guy with a little scar, no. no. Until one doctor who was making the round of various groups said to me, I think I know who you're talking about. I said, can you get all of them, talk to him, find out if he's missing anybody? So a couple of days later, he came back, yeah, they want to see you. Oh, yeah, because somebody didn't show up. They don't know where it is. So I, the doctor took me to the town I was supposed to, and I will never forget that day. It was hot. It was in, in, in August. It was very hot. All the shutters of this, the town, the houses were closed. There was only four guys near the fountain that was running. Four guys. There was no, not a soul anywhere. And I was about two o'clock in the afternoon. Then I recognized Leon, the guy with the little scar. Then I took my belt with half a million francs. And I said, Leon, oh, I give him the password. He didn't reply to me. I gave him the money, he took me by the arm, took me away to a, a short distance to a farm, got into the backyard, opened the door of a pig sty and pushed me in. And the pig had left very short time before because they left the sack still there. And I was on a pig sty. This is the greeting I got from the people I was supposed to have. <laughs> and he started an interrogation. Then he would send the result of his request, of his talk to London. London said, ask him this talk. I know what he was doing. He kept asking me for the name of my mother, my maid, the maiden name of my mother. And of course, before leaving, they make sure that we had established a completely new identity. I had a new name, a new family, and I had, I could back up in France. Everything was covered. In other words, when I gave a name, they could go back to the place and it was there. So it was very well arranged. Except he wanted to know, I didn't know, he wanted to know the real name of my the mother, the, the main name of my real mother. And I wouldn't want to give him because they told us, never relieve anything about yourself regardless what it is, regardless to whom. Finally, I realized what was going on, so I gave up. I said, okay, my real mother's name is, and I, he said, why didn't you tell me this first place? Because, you know, we could avoid a lot of that stuff. I said, well, sorry, but we were told not to. So they finally accepted me, and I helped uh, create an organization, train these guys, and so on, and uh, eventually, we cleaned the area of, of, of uh, German, and we had full control of the entire area. But there's one more thing I want to tell you, is that the French did not know that. We didn't tell the French. We did not know if the Gaulle was able to control France after the war was over. They very strongly suspected a military government would have to be established. A military government usually use local people to do certain things, and then given name of several people they were going to use in the area. They wanted to know more about them. One of them was a banker. And when I asked uh, the people I was with, do you know this guy, this banker? Oh, yeah, he's pretty nice. He, he doesn't belong to the resistance, but he leaves the door, uh, the key to the door under the mat so we can go into the bank, steal money without breaking the door. 
too. It's very nice. Very cooperative banker. <laughs> so I said, would you like to meet him? I said, no, no. Would you like to meet his daughter? His daughter is a very good friend of my wife, and she'll be glad to introduce. So I met the daughter. Wonderful. Nice girl, six, seven, six, 17 years old girl, and big girl. She was a big girl for a French girl. She was a mother was Spanish. And the mother was the heir of Spanish castles, several of them. The banker was not the one with the money. It was the mother who had the dough. I learned all this through her. See. And then she didn't know exactly who I was. But one day she says, I want to see a parachute, a parachute job. She said, what do you ask me? She said, I know you, I know you and all you guys, you're invited on something, and I want to see you. I said, oh, are you kidding? Oh, we, you know, we don't know anything about it. Oh, come on. You can't kid me. I know. I said, okay, but well, we can't do it because she said, it's too dangerous. You realize what happened? Well, you know, we, you know, we have to take very strong precautions. She bugged us, she bugged us. Finally, we said, okay, okay, you can come. We'll take you there overnight. So one night, we took her to see a drop. We had three planes coming that night. And I told her, stay under that tree and don't move. And we work all night. We clean up the next morning. And at 6 o'clock, I return her back home. Two days later, her father calls me. He says, ah, oh. so, and she was there in the office with a smile, grinning and all. What is she doing? I said, ah, oh, Mr. Mr. Julien. They call me Mr. Julien. I understand you spent the night with my daughter the other night. <laughs> no, sir. No, sir. I certainly did not spend the night with your daughter. No, 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 no. I'm sorry. We should never. We should have asked you before we took the daughter to see her daughter. That was our mistake. We should never do it again. No, 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 no. This is okay. I don't mind. What do you mind? I mind that the neighbors are talking and that a reputation is now zilts down the drain. And the only honorable thing for you to do is to marry my daughter. <laughs> now, they don't cover this in training. <laughs> Shandong Sh wedding does not exist in, 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 our, in, our, in, our, in our system. So I sent a message to London. I said, hey, what the hell do you want me to do? The man wants me to marry his daughter. The reply was rather short. Ha, ha, ha. Hey, Jerry. Do nothing. Get back as soon as you can. Come on. Look. And disappear. Just disappear. That was our, our solution. Disappear. I could not avoid her from that moment on. She was on my tail. All day long, maybe at night, or I don't know. And I didn't want anything to do with her. You know. I liked her, but I didn't want anything to do with her. So one day I disappeared, and that was the end. Uh, now, you think it's just the end of the story? <laughs> no, it's not. It's not the end of the story. Because a year or, a year or so later, I'm in China. I'm in China. I land in one evening, and the next morning, our company clerk says, oh, you turn, oh, we have a, a cable or a telegram from you. I said, oh my God, something happened to my parents. That's all. I looked at the telegram and said, it was signed, Simon. How did you find out what I was? <laughs> I thought I had lost the thing, and then she found it. So I, I told the, uh, the clerk, I said, so what am I gonna do? She's liable to show up for Tell you, and I, I don't want that to happen. He said, no, I'll, I'll take care of it. And indeed, he did the right thing. I never heard anything about her since. That was, until years later, she thought I was dead. <laughs> that was what we declared. That's what happened to Simone. Simone's father became, Simone's father became a senator huh? at the same time as Mr. Mitterrand. Mitterrand became a senator and they were very close friends. He wanted to marry Simone. Mitterrand wanted to marry Simone. 
but Mitterrand's real wife didn't want a divorce. <laughs> <laughs> so this, this is so old Simone was left. You know, maybe she's still single. I don't know what happened. <laughs> Do we have any question now? <laughs> Oh, we, so would I. <laughs> you know, let me, the record of the Air Force shows that 29 planes came to me to support my mission. 29. I can only account for 19. 10 of them, we don't know what happened. We have no idea. Now, who are those guys that I met? This is something that very few people do. We didn't even know them. This was not a regular resistance group. It was a resistance group who had been organized by Moscow. <laughs> Moscow had set up what Moscow did. They contacted French officers who were no longer officers. The army did not exist. And made a deal with them. They said, look, we'll pay you, we'll, we'll help you if you create so that those French officers never realized who they were working for. Well, they had no idea who they were. And they said, well, we don't have the means to support you, so we suggest that you steal the stuff <laughs> from the other group. And that's what they were doing. They were stealing stuff from the other group. They were penetrating all the group, found out the key, the, the secret, and then established a drug zone somewhere else. And in the process, I lost 10 planes. This is what's going on. Do you know what happened to the two women that were being held? The two, no, they, they were buried. They were buried, and they, yeah, they told me they killed them. Oh yeah, they, they were very, they were ruthless. Unfortunately, you never know if they were killing people because they were guilty or because they wanted to steal what they had. And this is what happened in France. Most of the Jewish companies that had uh, more of the businesses, the French would squeal on them or do something and they steal everything they own and, and let the Germans. In my hometown, only two Jews, there was quite a few Jewish people, only two of them escaped. All of them went to Auschwitz or something. And uh, they, this guy, the picture. Can we get back the picture? Of the, uh, of the four guys. Yeah. This guy was a Polish officer. He was also, he had been recruited, he was working for a Polish, Polish Air Force. This was a Canadian. He was a Canadian officer. And this one was an American officer who was with me. We were we started our our uh, career together, and um, instead of coming back to the United States after the war, instead of coming back after the war, he stayed in France. His family was very well known in France. He was an expert on faience, he, and uh, I wanted the uh, Ginny to meet him, and she eventually met him. It was an uh, old Michael, and I'll never forget him when we were getting ready to jump behind the line. He was, he was not far from where I was, but I didn't know exactly where it was. And uh, I said to him, said, oh, you know, Michael, if you get caught, you don't have a chance. If they drop your pants, they know exactly who you are for. <laughs> and you haven't got harsh words for you. He said, ah, they're not gonna catch me, they're not gonna catch me. So I don't want to be so sure. Anyway, so eventually they, he was with a group that 20,000 Germans wanted to surrender. But they did not want to surrender to the resistance. They wanted to surrender to the American. He happened to be the only American there. So a German officer, general, had to <laughs> give his sword to my wife. I said, Mike, did you know he was, did, did he know he was Jewish? He says, no. <laughs> I didn't want to tell him. <laughs> I didn't want him to feel so bad. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> that was. Um, any more questions? Yes. When and how did you meet your wife? Uh, yeah. Oh, my, that was my last post. I remained in the army after the war for 22 years, and uh, I was stationed at Fort Harrison as a counterintelligence agent in uh, in in, uh, in her Fort Harrison. And she was on active duty at the time. So we met her at the fort, and so I met her. It's a good thing I met her, because if I hadn't, I'd probably be dead by now. <laughs> so, I paced to marry a nurse. Okay. <laughs> Anybody has got any, any comments to make? Would I do this again if I had the opportunity? Hell no. <laughs> I was stupid. I mean, I, you know, when I, when I stop and think, I say, what was I thinking, you know? Going, dropping behind the German line. But in, when you're 21, nothing can happen to you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much. That was once in a lifetime. We have three books left. They're $10 a piece. Again, special deal. You will not.